It, it birthed lost people walking in the door unannounced, not even knowing why they were there and falling on their knees and crying out, would somebody tell me how to be saved? Well, welcome to our One Cry podcast. Uh, we're thrilled to have you today. And I'm Bill Elliff, and this is Kyle Reno. Hey, hey. And uh, Kyle, and I'll, Kyle and I both serve with uh, One Cry in this way and some other ways. And we're also both pastors right. uh, at the Summit Church in, in uh, Central Arkansas. And uh, today, uh, we're beginning a little series, Kyle, uh, for the next three weeks to take a little historical uh, walk through the Jesus movement of the late 60s, early 70s, one of the most significant movements that's happened in American history. Um, and, and, and we want to do that because we have a lot to learn about. That. Well, and it's sh- it shaped the spiritual leadership of our country now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 40 uh, and came to Christ at 19 years old, and every spiritual leader, every significant spiritual leader in my life, from the pastor I came to Christ under, serving with you, mentor in my life, every one of them were radically changed in the Jesus movement. Wow. And they share this common heartbeat and desire that, and I think the truth is, I think that they have been leading, that generation has been leading our country spiritually for the last decades, and it, and it makes me aware of we need to see another one. And I know you know that, and I know you've mm-hmm. studied the history of it, and I, I think today what you want to share is so important. Yeah. Like what precedes a movement like that? What comes before it? So teach us some of that, Bill. Yeah. You know, always when you see something in life, uh, there's usually some previous when a new child is born, there's been nine months of previous. Uh, when someone comes to be born again, there's been years of the working of the Holy Spirit, convincing, convicting, revealing Christ. Uh, it's a prior work that happens to lead to the moment of salvation. And what's true of those new births is also the birth, true of the birth of revival. One of the great leaders uh, in the Welsh revival wrote 20 years after that revival about this. And here's, here's what R.B. Jones says in his little book, Rent Heavens. He says, though every revival ultimately culminates in a form which attracts the attention of all, no revival is of sudden origin. Behind the startling outbursts is a process which goes on for years, a purifying and preparatory process. It was so in connection with that of 1904, the 1904 Welsh Revival, which swept around the world. If you study the, the, the national revivals, nationwide revivals that have happened in American life, you will discover that there were things that were happening in the 10 years prior that set the stage for revival, that brought us to a place of desperation. I was thinking about this one day, and I began to read in the Gospel of Luke, an account that's in all four of the Gospels is the story of John the Baptist coming before Christ. He was a forerunner, the Bible says. And uh, you say, well, what does that have to do with revival and spiritual awakening? Well, when revival comes, I mean nationwide revival, it's the manifest presence of God. And John the Baptist came to prepare us for the coming of Christ? What could be more manifest? What could be more visible than the literal, physical presence of Christ? So for these next few weeks as we study the Jesus movement, I I want us to think in terms of what's going on right now that could be a precursor to revival. And I think you'll see that we we are ripe. We are ready. It is time. As a 70-year-old man who lived through the Jesus movement myself, and it shaped my life, it's fascinating to notice that I, I have seen two periods in our nation's history of great anarchy, of riding in the streets, of sexual revolution. And you know when those were? It was the 1960s, and it's the decade that we're in right now. And I think... Uh, God is letting us 
go and seeing our, our desperate need for him, it's waking up the church and preparing us for revival. So what happens when God is preparing to send his manifest presence? Well, first of all, voices are sent. And when we look at John the Baptist, it says about him in John 1, 6, there came a man sent from God. That just, that, the simplicity of that statement just blows me away. It didn't say there was a man born through his parents. No, it, it says about John the Baptist, he was sent from God. And you say, well, what was that man, what was he sent to do? And the Bible's very clear about this in John 1, 23. John said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. In other words, I'm not supposed to do this and that and the other. I'm not supposed to go construct a church somewhere. I am come, coming to prepare the way for the Lord. And I'm a voice, and I'm crying in the wilderness, the darkness, the tangled mess of our society. And you say, well, what was, what was this voice? Uh, where did he get his message? Well, it says in Luke 3, 2, in the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. So here's a man sent from God, came to be a voice, and the word of God came to him. And you say, what was that voice supposed to say? When you study Luke and John and these accounts of John the Baptist's life, you see that it was, first of all, a message of repentance. John came and said, where you're going is not right, and you need a change of mind that will turn you back to come to Christ, to the Messiah. It was a message of repentance. Secondly, it was a message of judgment. I mean, John was, John was real clear about this. If you don't come, judgment is coming. It's coming. And uh, he, he, he just minced no words about that. But it was also a message of hope. He said, uh, one is coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and, fi and fire, and uh, he's going to burn up the chaff, but get ready, it's going to be good. The Messiah is on the way. Now, I'm a pastor. I've preached on all kinds of themes in my life. But I want to tell you right now, the burning message of my heart is repent. We're in a, in a moment in our nation's history where we are under the judgment of God. We see all the indicators of that, and we better turn and pursue the Messiah. We better come back to God. I was reading the other day, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who uh, you know, spent his life devoted to understanding the Russian Revolution in which 60 million people were killed. And Solzhenitsyn said, I, I've studied this and I've written volumes of books about it. But in all of my interviews, in all of my studies, let me tell you why this happened. We as a nation forgot God. It sent a chill down my spine when I read that, because that's America. We are forgetting. We are turning from God. And this current spirit and decade of anarchy and rioting and sexual change and all that's happening so dramatically right now has happened before in our history, never to quite the extent that it's happened. And uh, we need to repent. The judgment of God is upon our nation. But there's hope. Christ is coming and has come, and he wants to come in a great reviving work. So, so a voice comes. And all across America right now, what's fascinating is uh, 15 years ago, I didn't hear any pastors talking about revival and spiritual awakening. Now, almost every pastor I talk to has this on his heart. God is raising up voices all across our nation with the same theme. That's encouraging. The second thing that happens in God's preparatory work towards revival is that desperation grows. It's really fascinating in this passage. Uh, look at Luke 3. It says in verse 10, And the crowds uh, were questioning John the Baptist, saying, What shall we do? And then verse 12, The tax collector collector said, 
Teacher, what shall we do? And then verse 14, the soldiers, now these are Roman soldiers. The soldiers were questioning him, saying, and what about us? What shall we do? Now, have you heard anybody say that lately to you? Man, our nation is in a mess. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? That's the, that's the question of a desperate heart. We've tried this. We've tried this. We've tried the government plan. We've tried the money plan. Uh, what are we going to do in our nation? And this desperation is rising. If you understand the cycle of revival in the Bible and in history, you realize that there are moments when the church is walking with God, but then we fall away, and God in His grace sends His discipline or judgment, uh, trying to get our attention to say something's wrong, you need to change. And when it gets hot enough, when it gets desperate enough, you read this little phrase, and all the people cried out. And all the people cried out. I've studied this. I can't find one place in Scripture where all the people humbly cried out that God didn't hear and send a reviving and awakening to the land. And that's what he's doing with us right now. Uh, this period that we're in is bringing us to a needed desperation. And there is what one of my friends calls a rising tide of prayer that's happening. And uh, I think, Kyle, we're going to get to a tipping point here, and God's going to hear that united cry. And I think we're right on the edge of revival, if not, if not even that we're in the beginning stages of revival. We haven't seen the awakening that we saw in the Jesus movement. But we're seeing an, a reviving of the church in prayer like we haven't seen in, in decades. I tell you, as you're just sharing that, as you align the times, like the 60s and the decade that we're in now, and you see the precursor and what God, it just makes me want to cooperate. Yeah. It, it, makes, it makes me pray, oh God, don't let this moment pass us by. Not this moment pass us by. Don't let this moment pass the church by. It just, man, get the sails up. Yeah. Saying like, Lord, we, we are rightly desperate. We need something totally supernatural mm -hmm. again. We're, we're as broken and as bad as we've been in a long, long time. Right. You know? And do it again, Lord. Yeah. Amen. And you know, just historically, as we're thinking historically in these next three weeks, every 30 to 60 years in American life, God has brought a reviving that was nationwide in its scope. And we're going to hear about that now from one of our dear friends, Michael Catt. Uh, you would know Michael from uh, Sherwood Church and Sherwood Pictures that mm -hmm. produce so many war room and courageous and so many. But uh, Michael was a man who was in that, in that uh, movement of God. And we're going to hear some of the personal stories of what happened. So listen very carefully to this interview. Well, Bill and Kyle, thank you so much. I just love listening to the two of you talk about revival and then to hear you pray and teach on revival. So thank you. And as you know, today we are so, so blessed to talk about the Jesus movement, but specifically someone whose life was deeply impacted, changed the trajectory of his life as he became a pastor and really a revival movement leader. So we have with us today, Michael Cat. you are in the Smoky Mountains. I'm up here by Lake Michigan. You get the mountains, I get the water. I don't know who the winner is, but I am so glad to connect with you today. Well, I think we're both winners because we live in, in great places and uh, great, grateful. To, I, I look out my door every day and see the majesty of God Amen. in his creation. And the cool thing about that, what a segue to what we're talking about today, the power of God, the majesty of God, all that are characteristics of uh, movements of God in revival. So, Michael, I want to begin before we jump into that topic. Uh, I, I just we've tracked for what, decades now and yeah. uh, just loved being friends. I want this to just be a like a conversation sitting there on your porch overlooking the beauty of that creation. Okay. And, and uh, but I, I've always been amazed at how 
Sherwood Church, as much as any church I know, has always been in pursuit of a movement of God and revival. And, and somebody would ask, how would you describe Sherwood Church? I would often say it has a spirit of revival about it. So talk to us just briefly. Um, man, how did that happen? And, and that's just unusual today. Well, it, it came about really because of Vance Havner coming to my church during the Jesus movement. Hmm. And Havner was a prophet and a revivalist. And it birthed in me, uh, I, I want what he's got. Hmm. I, I want that passion. And I didn't want to be in ministry and not have D, the DNA of revival in hmm. my life or in my church. Hmm. And I think a, a church, especially when you pastor a church 31 years, hmm. uh, a church takes on the DNA of the pastor. And so if, if a pastor doesn't have a DNA for revival, the church won't have a DNA for revival. Mm -hmm. And I wanted our people to long for it, to pray for it, to believe in it, even mm -hmm. if they never saw it on the scale of a Jesus movement. I think you said one time, revival is little r, big r, yeah. uh, that at least in their personal lives, they could experience revival. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, it's just a part of who I am. It's and, part of who the church was. And I loved that about you, Michael, still do. And um, as Leonard Ravenhill, I think, who said one time, if you're willing to live without revival, you will. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you weren't willing to pastor without revival. Uh, no. and, and so many pastors are willing to pastor without revival. So they do. And uh, so thanks, just thanks as a friend and as a colleague, as a fellow soldier, really in the mission, mm -hmm. just constantly, constantly being patient about wanting to see the glory of God come on great display. Well, thank you. Well, I was born in the 60s. I don't want to date. I mean, I wasn't born. I graduated in high school in the 60s. I don't want to date you. I think you did too, probably. And, and uh, boy, what a, what a. Uh, they, they actually call it the 60s. You, you don't hear them saying the 80s and the 70s. There was something about the 60s where I remember Time Magazine said, we do not know if America will survive. So align it with today, parallel. I mean, we had the Vietnam War. We had the Afghanistan War. We had the, uh, back then the riots on the streets of many cities, not just some cities, the racial strife, the whole um, toxic sexual revolution movement was birthed, feminism was birthed, even the beginnings of public display of gay lifestyle was birthed. I mean, so many things that surfaced in the 60s. And uh, I just I, I, I just wondered then how in the world will I even live to the 80s and 90s? And we did. And they say the 60s and the cultural and the social and the, and the, and the racism re revolution actually went to about 74. I find that interesting. Hmm. Uh, so injected in the middle of that is the Jesus movement. You had a yeah. personal experience. You've studied the Jesus movement. Uh, we just want to listen to your heart today as it relates to that. Michael, I do. Well, I think I minored in history in college. I think history repeats itself. I think the book of Judges tells us people can have deliverance and a move of God, an undeniable mm -hmm. intervention of God in the life of a nation. And then they get complacent mm -hmm. and they get apathetic and the, and the zeal for God wanes or the leader dies and, and they just go back. It's that cycle of sin and mm. crying out to God and sin and crying out to God. And I think there's so much about the 60s that parallels today, just like you said. Mm. Um, uh, it, it hit my church in about 1970. Mm. And a guy named Leo Humphreys mm. came to our church and preached a revival. And it just happened. I mean, it, it just happened, Byron. He took a street witnessing. I didn't know what street witnessing was. I'd never done it in my life. Mm. Uh, I didn't know how to pray and believe God for great things. I'd never done it. And here's this guy that is oozing passion mm. for Jesus. And so we started connecting with him as our in our youth group. 
And I will never forget, we had a fellowship one night in a house of a church member, and Leo had joined Arthur Blessed mm. on the walk across America with the cross. Wow. And at a youth fellowship with cookies and Kool-Aid, that's all we had. We got on, they had three phones in their house. That's why we went there. And we got on a call and tried to listen on a landline Mm. to Leo Humphreys in a phone booth at the Washington Mall talking about what was happening when they had arrived in Washington, D.C. with a walk with a cross. And I thought to myself, who in the world walks across America with a cross? And who joins them in that? And it just birthed in me out of the box thinking Mm. that when revival hits, it doesn't fit the normal Mm. church. Uh, It started prayer meetings in our church where we had, you know, sometimes 300 young people praying Mm. six and eight hours a night Mm. for lost people. It birthed lost people walking in the door unannounced, not even knowing why they were there and falling on their knees and crying out, would somebody tell me how to be saved? Mm. Uh, It it birthed drug addicts and drug dealers walking into our youth group and a bunch of 18 and 19 and 20 year olds Mm. and our youth minister and two other adults, because all the other adults Mm. thought we were crazy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, gathering around them and praying for them. And I can distinctly remember guys coming in with all kind of drugs in their pockets Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden starting to rejoice in the Lord that they've been set free and just handing the drugs over, (laughs) you know, just, just getting rid of them and saying, I'm free, I'm free, you know, and Mm -hmm. I mean, it marked me for life. It just marked me for life. Wow. And Michael, I'm just uh, thinking of uh, where I was in my uh, circle streams back then, and honestly uh, rejected most of what was transpiring. And, uh, and, and because methods were different, like you said, and the styles were different. And we put God in a box and said, could God really be working in, in, in that uh, context? And he was amazingly so. And I often wonder the parallels today, maybe in an individual church or in a denomination or some stream. Um, why do you think we are so hesitant to let God do His work? And maybe why did it? Why did? The, why were there those back then that literally rejected it and condemned it, basically? And yet there were others who were just wide open to arm to, yeah. to this is God. So talk to us because <laughs> I think that might, I don't know, Michael, do you think that might apply even to individual churches that are afraid that too much change will happen or something? I, th- I think on a little R level, it's a, an important thing you're talking about and a big R. Well, I, I think, I think two things. I think first of all, for the pastor, it's the fear of man. Yeah. It's the fear he's going to lose his job. And, uh, you know, I lost my job in 1976 as a part-time youth minister for seeing some African-American kids come to Christ and for quoting Martin Luther King Hmm. in the church newsletter. Um, I I think the fear of man, what, what if I don't have my job? And that's where too many pastors have their identity in their titles and not in Christ. That's the first thing. And I think the religious structure of Pharisaic churches that are worried more about who's on the committee and, you know, the constitution and bylaws and the rule of thumb is not the word of God. It's not, this is what God says. And you look at the seven churches in revelation. I mean, five of the seven Jesus says, repent or else. Well, I would dare say five of the seven churches in any town in America, Jesus would say, repent or else. Mm. And it's because, as you said, we're content to live without revival. We want our 
denominational structure. We're afraid that people will talk about us at the coffee shop and we don't live for the pleasure of God. Hmm. And revival is not comfortable. No, no, it's not. And if we're, uh, I mean, I, you've been in a church a long time. I've been in this organization forever, it seems, 40 some years. And, and uh, it, it can become comfortable. The familiar can become comfortable. Yes. And, uh, so I guess what you're saying during the Jesus movement, God did things out of our comfort zone. And in many ways, we weren't willing to follow the Lordship of Christ through the authority of his word, as you just referenced, in order to do his work um, and, and, and get out of our comfort zones. And so I, I, uh, I look around today and wonder if COVID, if uh, I believe the coming economic stress, if it's not already here, and all those things that we were putting our security in, God is just taking it right out from under us and uh, saying, okay, uh, I'm going to force you out of your comfort zone so you have no choice but to turn to me. Well, so, I think uh, Vance Havner, one of my favorite Vance Havner quotes is, uh, God comforts the afflicted and afflicts yeah. the comfortable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he'll rock your world. Mm. And revival brings its own set of problems. I mean, in most people are scared of it because, uh, as you know, as, as Bill knows, as a, a lot of people know, uh, it changes the DNA of a church. And sometimes people that are in power are no longer qualified to be in power. Mm. And people that have authority are no longer qualified to have authority. And all of a sudden, somebody that just loves Jesus rises to the top and th those who are very, very, very religious, but may be lost, mm -hmm. they resent it, they hate it, and they fight it. I mean, the most religious people of the day killed Jesus. We cannot mm -hmm. expect mm -hmm. revival to come to a church and there not be people that hate the message or the messenger. So let's jump into maybe some of the chief characteristics, as you remember, of the Jesus movement. You know, I keep in my study on the wall where I can look at it, uh, framed a, a copy of Life magazine dated June 1972 with this young person on the shoulders of another young person at the Jesus rally. Was that you? <laughs> No, that wasn't, that wasn't me. I wish it had been me. But their arms are up like this. They were oh, yeah. praising Jesus. One and, white t-shirt uh, on. <laughs> and it was the and it's the cover of Life magazine. And I, I I sit there and I say, God, you could do that again. Yeah. You could yeah. actually place on the cover of the most every magazine, every newspaper, every website, uh, what God is up to. So talk to us about some of the characteristics that stand out in your mind in, in that season? Well, it was on the cover of Life, Look, and Time, the three biggest magazines in America. Uh, when, when the Jesus movement hit, it became an unavoidable conversation. I mean, you had to talk about it. Uh, there was no social media then. There were three news networks and three basic magazines. You, you, you could not deny what was happening in the midst of the Vietnam War and protests and everything else. You couldn't deny Chuck Smith baptizing 2,000 people in a cove in California. Uh, you cannot deny that out of the Jesus movement came contemporary Christian music. I mean, there was a, uh, the, the former editor of uh, CCM said that young people shared the message of Jesus in a tool that they understood, and that was music. And so Love Song, Andre Crouch, all these people one way, you know, they, they brought this music into the church. It was sometimes rejected, especially yeah. if you plug the guitars into the wall. <laughs> uh, and had drums, but we have praise teams in our churches now. Uh, we have songs of worship that are different than hymns because of the Jesus movement. I mean, it was, we would sit around and sing those songs 
I mean, even a song like Pass It On, you know, and we had one guy that knew two songs on a guitar and we wore them out. But it was like, this is our music of how we express ourselves to God. Hmm. So I think revival, I mean, look at the Reformation. Yeah. Revival always births new expressions of worship hmm. and of glorifying God. Hmm. It, it doesn't diminish the old. It's just a new expression. Hmm. And uh, it, it, it changes, and it, it seems to always start with young people. Uh, every revival seems to start with young people. Yeah. Secondly, it always begins in prayer. Mm. It does not begin in a program. You know that. I mean, Life Action talks about that all the time. Um, if it's not birthed in prayer, it's going to die. Uh, it, and I think what it revealed was people doing ministry in the energy of their flesh as opposed to a move of God. You know, I, one of my favorite stories is John Bassanio during the Jesus movement mm. at First Baptist Houston. Church running 300, it was dying. Mm. Bassanio figured it out, had three months of meetings and baptized 1,600 young people, mm. you know, young people, and had young people sitting on the steps in the church and had to move out of the church to go to a convention center. Stuart Briscoe got it. Mm. His church went from 200 to 2000 in a year. Chuck Smith got it, you know, with the youth Bible studies going three hours. And Greg Laurie. Greg Laurie came out of that. I mean, there would be no what's happening with Greg Laurie today had there not been a Chuck Smith who was willing to say yes. And, and that's the key, Byron. You got to be willing to say yes. You know, number one, I think that's you there on the bottom. And yeah, you, no, you're, no, no, that, that's not me. I'm not that cool and I can't hold that much. <laughs> well, those two guys on the shoulders of that one underneath remind me of those who have been on your shoulders these years that you've been carrying along. Hey, let, let's go back to the 70s. You talked a little bit about the fruit, Greg Laurie, and so forth. But, you know, uh, when God moves, even apart from what is highly visible, he's doing things behind. Life action was birthed during the Jesus movement. Mm -hmm. Family life today was birthed during this Jesus movement. Mm -hmm. Focus on family, not even revival driven ministries, right. but family driven was birthed then. And, you know, I was invited by an ex girlfriend back in college to go to St. Mary's, across from Notre Dame University, uh, for something she was coming to town to, to be a part of. I had no clue what it was. It was the charismatic, the birthing of the charismatic renewal movement in the Catholic Church. I arrive, and all these people dress like hippies. They're, they're dancing. They're singing. They're going around in circles. I was freaked out, honestly, because of just the stream I was in. But now I look and say, even inroads, frankly, into the Catholic uh, uh, stream was birthed during the, the whole Jesus movement. Yeah, I, th I think the fruit. I think one of the things revival does is it erases denominational lines over secondary issues. And it brings us together with a common passion and a common purpose. And, uh, you know, we we we're in too many silos, mm -hmm. you know, we've got my, my turf, my silo, and we don't know how to stretch our arms out yeah. and bring in a brother that on a secondary thing, we might disagree, mm -hmm. but on the essential need of a move of God and Jesus is the only way to salvation. Mm -hmm. I can agree with a lot of people in a lot of streams in a lot of silos, if we could just sit down together like you and I are doing and say, what is it that we want to see happen in this world? We don't want to stay on the road we're on because really we're not on a road. We're in the ditch and we got to get out of the ditch and get back on the road. And that road's a narrow road to Jesus, but it's wide when it comes to 
Well, that's a secondary. They do the Lord's Supper differently than we do. They, their music is different than ours. And one of the things I love that One Cry has done is bring people together across denominational lines to pray together. Because on our knees, we are not really different. Right, that's right. And you know the mantra of that kind of internally here that we quote often to ourselves is we aren't asking other streams to lay down their distinctives, just prioritize them. Yes. That if we don't see a divine intervention of God, those little distinctives really aren't going to matter. And I promise in Afghanistan with the Christians there now, uh, they aren't battling over those issues that are not central to the faith. They're clinging to each other as they cling to God as one. Yeah. So Michael, our time's up here, man. I, I would love to go on for hours and, um, uh, but I would love you to pray for the pastors, the leaders, those who are uh, just p- listening and watching today, uh, that God would just infuse within them the faith that, and and the openness, really, that you have modeled for so many of us to be open to what it is God wants to do today. So would you pray for us? I'll do it. Father Paul wrote, the things that you have learned and heard and seen in me, these impart to faithful men that they will teach others also. There's a real possibility that there are four generations in one verse. And Lord, there are those of us who are in the final seasons, the, what Robert Wilgamuth says is the gun lap right. of our lives. And uh, if we don't see another revival, then it's all going to be secondhand stories uh, by people who hear about them secondhand but never experience them firsthand. And I pray for a generation of pastors and youth pastors and children's workers and moms and dads and young people that they will have birthed in them a hunger for more of you Mm. and that they will find that this world will never, ever satisfy them, that their identity needs to be in Jesus Christ, that their hope needs to be in the gospel that revival is our only hope. And Lord, I I pray that whether it is a tidal wave or a tide, whether it is is a hurricane or a smooth, silent wind that blows across Mm -hmm. our backs and moves us on, that we would see in the coming days a revival. I would pray that you would take all these prayer meetings Mm -hmm. that are popping up around the country and unite them like a network, like has never been seen before in our country, and that you would bring one more time to this land before you come back, a great move of Jesus in our land among a generation that never gets over what you do in their lives. For pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. And uh, hey, tell Terry a big hello. I'll do it. I'll do it. Thank look you. look forward to coming to that breakfast joint and having breakfast with you. Now, there's a name for that. What is it? Uh, pancake Pantry. Yeah, it's not a joint. Pancake. It's pancake. not Pancake House. It's Pancake Pantry in Gatlinburg. If you I've go anywhere there. else, you lose the anointing. <laughs> okay. Hey, pastors, uh, go look up Michael. He promised to treat you for breakfast at Pancake Pantry. Hey, Bill, Kyle, thanks for giving us this time. What a blessing. And we're with you and trusting God for another outpouring of his spirit like the Jesus movement. Man, I love Michael Cat. Yeah, I love so, me some cat. I love, yeah. that. I love that cat. Yeah. yeah. And just his heart. And I think, man, mm-hmm. how many pastors could sit in that interview right now that's around the same age and demographic as Michael and, and talk about how God shaped him shape their ministry and it just makes me go lord please do that now you know we need to pray for the next the next era of spiritual leadership to experience a real manifest move of god you know uh if i can interrupt just a little bit i i about uh, two months ago i went down in uh benton arkansas just yeah. south of here and they'd asked me to come lead a, a little citywide group that was praying hmm. There was a woman beside me who was about my age, mm-hmm. and she prayed. Yeah. She knew how to pray. Mm-hmm. And after it was over, I said, uh, where did you learn to pray? She said, during the Jesus movement. <laughs> I, it just blew me away. Yeah, sure. Because there was a, 
there was a spirit yeah uh and an understanding that yeah. came in the atmosphere of revival wow. uh about how to communicate with the lord so we we want to pray for that you yeah, know even right now, now. yeah I, every time we get i love the rhythm god's given us to learn some revival truths to hear some real stories mm-hmm. and then to really pray you know, so I want to encourage you. We want to encourage you wherever you are right now, driving in the car, don't close your eyes, but driving in the car or listening to the podcast. We want to pray each time, but don't just listen to us pray. You pray. What's God saying to you now? Bill's going to start us and I'll close us mm-hmm. in a second. Uh, Lord, I, I never uh, tire of hearing the stories of what you've done when you manifest yourself. Lord, we love to hear every Sunday about one person being saved and another life that's changed or a family that's turned. Lord, it's just so wonderful. But when we hear about these moments when you rend the heavens and come down and you give us a unmistakably clear picture of what heaven is like, it's a picture that we've forgotten, and you accelerate the movement of God uh, and seeing thousands and millions of people saved in brief order, or I just we can't we can't even voice, Lord, is just God do this again, please. We long for this in our day, and Lord, we say with millions of other Christians who are praying right now in our generation, oh God, come mm. in power and send a great revival to the church that would result in a spiritual awakening. Lord, maybe even the Hmm. final awakening that would come and the Word of God preached to all the nations, Hmm. and then you would come. Hmm. So, Lord, we we just pray. We just pray that we would recognize the signs, Lord, and cooperate with you. Hmm. Yeah, Lord, I agree with every word of that. And I, I pray, Lord, what? adjustments in our lives, uh, Lord, even for everyone that's listening today, for me, for Bill. God, what does it look like for us, uh, Lord, to be prepared? God, to be ready. Mm -hmm. Lord, uh, what does it look like for us to prepare the way, God, to get others ready Mm -hmm. for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? And I I mean, before you ultimately come, Mm -hmm. we need you to come in power now to Mm -hmm. redeem, uh, Lord, a lost generation and and lord to put into place again the truths of your word yeah god so please get us ready god i i pray that we would embrace desperation today god and that would be manifested in how we pray Mm -hmm. and i pray it in jesus name amen amen well we're so glad that you have have joined us today and next week uh don't miss it because you're going to hear the story of a man whose life was turned around who was used nationally in the Mm. Jesus movement, and then opened the door for God to use this man literally all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it came out of those days of the Jesus movement. So uh, we'll see you next time.